Welcome to the sixth installment of the Hendersonville RC Club Show. We took a little break since the weather lately has not been ideal for flying. Nevertheless, there are planes to be built and this is the best time to do it. The boys in Halix Hangar have had several questions about the Hacker Helio Courier project, particularly about covering the plane. So this time they have asked a friend and fellow club member, Bill Carroll, to stop by and share some tips about the art of covering a wing. After that, we go back in time to the MTRCCA's fly-in in Columbia last September to check out two beautifully made scale aircraft that flew in the event. Now. Turn off all electronic devices, excluding those set to Hendersonville's own Channel 3, and buckle up, cause here we go. Hello, welcome again to Craftsman's Corner. I'm Percy Halleck. And we're back again at Halleck's Hangar. I'm Fred Fisher. Today we've invited a, a fellow club member and a good friend, Bill Carroll. Bill's the man that we turn to, Fred and I do, whenever we need help with metal work or when we have an engine we can't get running correctly. And it also turns out that Bill is an, uh, pretty much an expert on monocoat covering of aircraft. We've had a lot of questions about uh, the proper methods to use for that, and Bill was kind enough to offer to help. Thank you very much for the compliments, Fred and Percy. Uh, I am not considered an expert at Montauk, but I'm fairly good. I, we have some people, particularly one that passed away not too long ago, Joey Quinn, who I felt like was a real expert at it, and Joey gave me a lot of tips. There was another gentleman by the name of Doug Whiteacre that lives in Galveston, who I consider a very expert at mining coke. He also had given me some tips. So I'll try to pass mm -hmm. those along this morning as we go along. Mining coke is a mylar uh, type of material that is sensitive to heat. It has a backing on the material that is a glue that is heat sensitive. Uh, in other words, uh, you apply heat to it and the, and the glue softens up and adheres to the material that, that you're trying to put it on. Preparation to put monocoat on wood has to be very, very smooth with no protruding uh, uh, anything on here because the, the monocoat will magnify any imperfections that are on the wood. So I usually sand down to 400 uh, grit and then brush off everything that I can find. Run my hand over to feel any imperfections that might be sticking out of the wood or uh, a joint that's not uh, completely smooth. So preparation is very important to put the monocoat on. You see the dust, I hope, coming off of the wing now. That looks pretty good. So we prepare. Firstly, you should measure and allow approximately one inch all the way around. I like to have a little bit more than that, maybe an inch and a half of, of overhang to cut the piece. So this, uh, this wing measures uh, 13 inches so I'm going to cut the piece about 15 and a half inches wide. 
you start in the center and measure out to the end. This measures 36 inches, so I'm going to cut the piece uh, 38 inches long. That gives me enough material to stretch and pull uh, and get all, as many wrinkles out as possible before you put the heat on. Fred is going to assist me here in holding things and helping me get ready to do the work. The monotote has a tendency to want to stay rolled up, so since Fred is going to be helping me, I'm going to let him hold it. Normally, I would use a piece of, of masking tape to hold this. A felt tip marker do fine because later on you should remove the mark by putting your alcohol on it and to clean off anything. Is that it, Fred? That's it. We marked 38 inches. If you never move the mark so there's a, a little edge on here that doesn't have any adhesive and doesn't have any color on it. It's just a clear plastic. So that that will not adhere to the wood and has to be removed uh, at a later time. I normally use a single edge razor blade to cut, but since I don't have one, I'm going to use my exacto knife. I might mention uh, a piece of glass is underneath this, which makes a good piece, good uh, uh, surface to cut on. Trying to cut on wood or something that, that the knife was cut into uh, doesn't work very well. So you need something hard underneath it that will allow you to cut the monocoat. Monocoat has a plastic backing on it that has to be removed before you can apply it to the surface. Now, if you were doing this by yourself, you'd put a piece of masking tape on here to hold it so you can pull this against itself. It forms static electricity as you pull it off, so you want to be working in an area that doesn't have a lot of dust in it. Now, if you were just to take this and pull it, you'd put wrinkles in the monocoat that would cause problems later on that you don't want. So you want to try to keep uh, from putting any wrinkles or anything in the monocoat before you start to try to apply it. Covering a wing, you start with the bottom so that the top part overlaps uh, of the bottom uh, uh, to finish up the, the, uh, the seams. So we're going to cover the bottom of this. First thing is to uh, try to center the material as near as possible, starting in the center, and try to get out as many wrinkles as possible so it's laying exactly where, where you like to have it finish up. So at this point in time, the iron is set at about 230 degrees. It's, it's so hot it will burn you, but not too too hot that it'll make the material uh, uh, shrink. Uh, heat makes this material shrink. What we want to do now is to make the glue adhere to the wood so we don't want the material to shrink. So I check it and see, and you touch, just touch. Mm -hmm. They call this iron on material, but I call it touch on material. When you, <laughs> when you iron the material, uh, Sometimes you'll iron wrinkles into it, touching it and pressing it down makes it adhere better. You go to the other end, and as I say, having Fred to help me makes it much easier. Normally I'd have to have some way to hold this material. You notice I have a little device underneath here that's holding it up off of the work surface. That allows me to be able to pull the material down this way when I get ready to seal it all the way around, mm. so I, I have a little device, just a piece of wood with two things to make it stand up. The next thing I want to do is try to get it in what I call a neutral position. When I say a neutral position, if you pull it this way, you see I'm putting wrinkles in it. I try to pull it so that there's no wrinkles in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And 
put it as tight as I feel like, not too tight, but a fair amount of pressure on it and touch it again in the middle. Then I go to one edge, try to get as many wrinkles out as possible. Touch it again. Go to the other edge and try to get as many wrinkles out as possible and touch it again. Now, I expect to see if I can pull these out before I go any further. And this looks pretty good. I haven't got any large wrinkles in there that won't come out by applying the heat. Mm. So my next move is to, is to touch it on the edge. Don't pull too hard and pull wrinkles into it, but pull as many wrinkles out as you can. Now at this point in time, I can go ahead and, and, and be sure this is all fastened down good in my first place. By doing that, I'll move along and press it down as I go. Now I go to the other end of the tip and stretch it here as far as I can and seal this in completely. Uh, at this point, we got too much material hanging here where the ailerons are going to go, so we're going to turn it over and try to remove part of that material. This is a gun that puts out hot air that will help seal the uh, monocoque. I have a little device here that I made that allows me to pull the material without burning my fingers. Work the work the out. There you go. Uh -huh. Work the wrinkles out as you go. This is also adhering the material to the wood by putting this heat on like this and and pulling down on it. And now we're going to try to get the wrinkles out of the weighing tip. And we have to be very careful and work with them a little at a time. You can see, I hope you can see, you have to hold it and let it cool so the glue will stick. We turn the ring around so I can pull the front leading edge down and, and uh, do the same thing. I start in the middle. Now it should be in here. I'm going to go back and take my iron now and be sure that I'm stuck all the way around. So I pull and press. Oh, sorry. No. You Just back that. me off. <laughs> pull and press. And now, trying to form a place I want to touch the monocoat. Monocoat is easier to touch before it is heated than it is after it's heated. So I don't pull down completely where I want to touch. I didn't bring, I didn't bring my devices, but we'll try to see if this will do the same thing. <clears throat> I have some angles that Cutting this like this is much easier. Then you got something to rest against down there. <laughs> cut only deep enough to cut the material, and if you pull it just a little as you go, don't mm. move the knife until you get a hold of it with your fingers. Otherwise, you have a cushy place. Fantastic. Right here, come in and make a couple of little small doors like that. That way you don't iron any wrinkles into it. Now you come back and seal the edges where you cut.
if I'm gonna pull this, I come in very carefully, make some little slices. So it's that not mm -hmm. all in one piece. Now very carefully press those down one at a time. And we're going to start and pull excess material, press. It becomes easier to do because I'll show you in a moment when we get ready to trim, it comes up easier than the leading edge does. The reason I've got something to go by here on the leading edge I don't have. So I, I come here at this point and cut it at an angle. Like so. This, I just follow the bottom of the wing. Let the razor blade slide along, being careful not to cut into the wood. <clears throat> Come back with the iron and be sure I seal down this little, there's a little bit of material there. You really can't see it, but you need to seal it down. Look on the edge, Fred. We trim this off. There again, being careful around this corner. This free hand. The wing tip is usually the hardest. The wing tip, like on a Ultra Sport, is uh, even tougher, isn't it? Yes, it is for me. Now this this piece, I come back and put it later on. While I'm doing this, I'll either put a piece on this before I cover or after I cover, to cover this flat end, normally a wing tip is tapered so you don't have this problem of a flat portion out right here. <clears throat> I like to have a soft rag. <clears throat> put, <laughs> put a little heat on it and rub it with the rag. That way I'm sure I'm seeing all the edges good. Let's see if I can get the wrinkles out there. Sorry to it work it towards the center. Sorry to edge and work towards the center. I'm trying to run, I'm trying to chase the wrinkles out of it. Of course, if it's true, they're, they're full. It takes more heat on the solid part than it does on the, on, on the open part. You notice in the middle where it's open, it shrinks a lot faster. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we sure want to thank Bill Carroll yep. for coming in and doing all this work on this wing for us. And I just want to tell you, for one who was here, I learned a lot. And I did too. Uh, I think I almost am ready to try some Monaco <laughs> myself. Thanks, well, Bill. Well, two things I, I said. It, it's uh, much easier with someone to help you. You can see Fred was holding the wing. Uh, otherwise, you have to devise some method of holding the material, so you can can stretch it as you go. Well, you uh, can help us anytime. Uh, uh, George, George <laughs> Quinn 
I guess was the one that taught me that several years ago that it's uh, the material is a stretchy material, all right, but uh, it, it won't get all the wrinkles out if you don't pull as many out as you can before you start to put the heat shrink to it. So uh, I thank uh, several people who's helped me over the years. But as I said earlier, Doug Whiteacre and George Quinn both have taught me a whole lot about mm -hmm. my coat. I'm not an expert by any means, but I'm a whole lot better than I used to be. And I've been using it for ever since it first came out. When you should buy it for $2.95 a roll, now it's $12.99. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. I am you're more than welcome. And anytime I can help you, let me know. And we'll see you all next time. Yep. Bye bye. Bye bye. This is a quarter scale version of Christian Husky. And this airplane is basically an Alaskan air truck. It's used by, primarily by bush pilots up in Alaska. It's known for its capability to haul uh, fairly large loads, heavy loads for its size. It has excellent uh, short field and rough field capabilities in that it can take off and land in a very short distance. If you go to the factory website for the Christian Husky, you can watch videos of the full-scale airplane uh, taking off and landing three or four times within the length of just this runway right here. It's quite an incredible airplane. This model is a, uh, as I say, it's a quarter-scale version of the full-size like the full-size airplane, it does have flaps, which give it the uh, short field control. This particular model is an ARF, manufactured by Pioneer Aircraft. It's powered by a Fuji 50cc gasoline fuel engine with an electronic ignition. The radio system is a JR10 that I converted over to 2.4 mega uh, gigahertz frequency. And, uh, it's a great flying airplane. I hope to use it in actual scale competition. A beautiful roll by the 310. Both the airplanes in the air right now are scale models. Here's a slow pass by the Christian Husky. Oh, that's high speed. <laughs> Pardon me, that was a high speed pass by the Christian Husky. <laughs> that was a higher speed pass by the Christian The mode is barely ticking over right now. Everything about it is exhilarating, yeah. and it uh, just gives you that tension, that adrenaline that I think we enjoy in this. That airplane's kind of like a race car. You've got to fly it a few times, then tear it completely down, and then put it back together, fly it in. We had some fiberglass that was split on the fuselage where we had to go in there and fix that, uh, just from landing on rough. Uh, runways, and um, outside of that, we yeah, the plane weighs a lot. It's a 76 pound airframe, and it takes its beats and bangs when you're flying at remote control, and you just have to keep up after it.
All right, thank you guys.